Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Uh, today we are going to discuss about how to approach a patients coming to ER with complaints of dizziness or vertigo. Dizziness basically, uh, patient it will be divided into either vertigo, that is the illusion of motion, which is often a spinning motion. Then it could be a near syncope, that is feeling of impending faint, disequilibrium, that is loss of uh, loss of balance while walking or it could be non specific dizziness while coming to vertigo while coming to vertigo it could be uh, a sensation of the environment spinning or any sensation of disorientation in space or sensation of motion which can disorientation in space or sensation of motion which can qualify as vertigo now coming to uh, approach to dizziness and vertigo if patient complains of dizziness, that is, there is no evidence of true rotatory sensation, then it could be either due to generalized tiredness of the patient, which could be secondary to any anemia, any infection that the patient is currently having, or the patient can describe it as a pre-syncope or lightheadedness. This could be again secondary to any arrhythmias or any MI, any hypovolemia in the patient, could be a vasovagal syncope, could be due to sepsis, it could be due to panic disorder, patient hyperventilating, or it could be a side effect of any drug, example any alpha blocker the patient might have taken. If the patient complains of spinning sensation or true rotatory uh, sensation, then we will come term it as vertigo. Now vertigo can be either peripheral causes or central causes. The differences between the both are peripheral attacks will usually be sudden, severe and will last for seconds to minutes. This nystagmus will mostly be horizontal rotatory that is crescendo decrescendo pattern. It will be worsened by head position. There will be no neurological finding but there could be auditory findings like tinnitus and hearing loss. While coming to central, nystag nyst uh, central vertigo, the attacks are usually gradual, mild. Uh, it could be continuous for weeks or months. Only difference being in case of vascular accidents where it can be sudden within seconds to minutes. Nystagmus here is more vertical or downbeat nystagmus. There is hardly any change with head position. There will be neurological finding and there will be no auditory finding. Now coming to causes of peripheral uh, uh, peripheral vertigo. Okay, let's break it here. Okay. So uh, in the emergency room, one of the most important difficult decision making, not very difficult actually, because only thing when we consider the financial stability of the patient, uh, it is a little bit uh, that th this patient really require a brain imaging. So that is the confusion that arises in our mind. There is no problem. You can straight away any dizziness vertigo come, you ask for an MRI, that is very easy to do. So that is not the topic of uh, discussion today. How to differentiate whom you need an imaging, whom you doesn't need an imaging. That is the crux of it. We are always concerned regarding a posterior circulation stroke. So, how best we can rule out a posterior circulation stroke in the ED mm. or how best we can diagnose clinically a posterior circulation stroke in the ED. Mm. So CT is out. I am not discussing at all about CT mm. because CT is not at all an imaging modality of choice when we are suspecting a posterior circulation stroke. Only the maximum thing what we will be able to see may be nearing the fourth ventricle because of the posterior circulation stroke mm. there will be some edema. That is the only thing what the best hands can visualize. Maybe that's the only subtle change that we'll be able to get. Otherwise, posterior circulation stroke, imaging of choice is not at all a CT. On even a CT angiogram, it might be difficult. Very rarely when you have a basilar artery thrombosis, mm -hmm. all those things, you might be able to help with an art, uh, CT angiogram. But only our concern, whom we should ask for an MRI brain to be done. For that risk stratification, we definitely need some tools in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So how to differentiate between a peripheral vertigo, central vertigo. dizziness, we will keep it aside mm -hmm. because dizziness itself mm -hmm. is a, a discussion topic where we have to discuss a lot of arrhythmias, mm -hmm. ectopics from ectopic pregnancy to abdominal aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm rupture uh, to a Brugada syndrome, all those things can come with a dizziness. So that's a totally different uh, uh, this thing. But the patient will come with saying that I am feeling giddy. Mm -hmm. So that will be the presentation. So we should be able to the first thing to differentiate between vertigo and dizziness that you have already explained. Now coming to the vertigo, how much type of vertigo you need to differentiate, whether the one simple thing that if the patient is significantly saying that he is having significant vertigo, even at lying down resting position, mostly we are dealing with an 
mostly significant significant symptoms significant symptom true rotatory vertigo even little bit shaking of head peripheral vertigo it will be more peripheral see in central vertigos they will be saying that they are having vertigo but they will be okay to sit in the bed mm. they will look stable in the ed mm. they don't have that much episode of vomiting mm. they will be look this peripheral vertigo they will be profusely sweating mm. they will have would have multiple episode of vomiting they would have already done and definitely there would have been some trigger mm. usually there will be some trigger for the peripheral vertigo uh, usually the most common one benign paroxysmal vertigo you have meniere's you have vestibular neuronitis like you have uh, otitis all those things something to do with the trigger will be there either a positional change or maybe a travel history might be there only after a, a bad travel in the bus i started developing the symptoms so some trigger you will be able to get so that is one from the history that we will be attribute and another important thing what i will because none of these guidelines says these things the risk factor of the patient so if the patient has got i am giving an history if the patient has got a previous history of an atrial fibrillation or already on blood thinners mm -hmm. or he had previous any embolic episode we have to definitely consider more towards a central vertigo mm -hmm. central cause mm -hmm. because the risk stratification of the patient is also in any valvular replacement done rheumatic heart disease history af history mm -hmm. so we have to think okay am i dealing with something so definitely even if your positional test everything is also positive mm -hmm. i might ask for an imaging for this group of patient where i don't want to miss any stroke mm -hmm. because they are at high risk of developing a stroke so there can be a combination of both central and peripheral mm -hmm. there can be some amount of central and peripheral combination can come and they have uh, uh, more worsening of symptoms due to the peripheral vertigo also so we need not miss that also so that is one differentiating features now the patient has is in front of your emergency room you give him some anti emetics you settle him down and make him calm down so what will be the next step that's what you are going to say is the approach how will you start evaluating them ideally you start evaluating them by taking the history a simple quick history then important things the questions what all questions you wanted to ask with him one important thing you ask for any visual disturbance then speech Not disturbance speech diplopia dysarthria ataxia ataxia any neurological um, uh, paresthesia focal deficit focal any neural deficit. focal neurological deficit mm. then dysmetria mm. then all mm. those things Dutation. are features that is dysphagia mm. swallowing difficulty all those d's that you can remember mm. it is more in favor of an mm. central mm. vertigo mm. dizziness even if you say dizziness with vertigo combination mm. i will put it as more into a central vertigo mm. rather than putting it in a peripheral vertigo mm. so peripheral vertigo the classical you will get a trigger there will be some uh, ear infection history some previous history is already there he's been on treatment for the same some tinnitus is able to give you the history hearing loss, hearing loss for a meniere mm. so acute presentation of meniere to the ed also can happen mm. it is not just coming all the cases are bpv but we definitely need a hearing test mm. and all those things to di confirm the diagnosis mm. so we'll put more in terms of a peripheral vertigo that is from our history then you start evaluating them so what are the simple bedside tests that you can do to differentiate this group so differentiate between central and peripheral vertigo we have a test which is known as a hints test hints test basically uh, is uh, consists of three tests that is the head impulse test nystagmus and the tests of skew so coming to the head uh, impulse test we have to ask the patient to fixate on a certain target and then we have to move his head to the right and then to the left in a normal person the fixated like the eyes should be fixed on a target it should not move with the head movement but in case of a peripheral cause of vertigo when we move the head the eyes will also move which will again second back to the fixed target so it will go and it will come back so if it happens that is more favorable for a peripheral cause of vertigo then coming to the nystagmus in nystagmus also uh, the direct uh, in central and versus peripheral nystagmus in central nystagmus uh, with the change of direction to left and right the direction of nystagmus also changes but in case of peripheral if it's the nystagmus is towards the left the patient if it looks on right or left the nystagmus will always be towards the left side left side wherever there is a disease side mm. affected side only it will look have the mm. nystagmus then the latency latency in case of uh, central causes will be short it will be more uh, sustained whereas peripheral nystagmus will be ill sustained then uh, intensity of central nystagmus will be less peripheral nystagmus will be high in intensity and uh, it is non fatigable central is non fatigable peripheral fatigable so after some time the speed will slowly come slowly down come. 
Then yes, central is mostly uh, a vertical, whereas peripheral is going crescendo, decrescendo. That is uh, horizontal, horizontal. Rotatory. And another thing is that sometimes you can have bidirectional also. Uh, bi Whenever you see uh, vertical as well as horizontal, it is again more in favor yeah, of a central instance, central cause. So that is the most uh, key things that you. It's you can differentiate it in the ED. It's not that difficult, mm -hmm. but you need to do it properly. You have to do a proper hint. Mm -hmm. So that is our first uh, nystagmus first head first impulse first and nystagmus you have completed. Then now we have test, test of skew. skew. In test of skew, we have to cover the patient's eye. Initially, the patient will look at the examiner's nose. So first you have to cover the left eye, then come back and cover the right eye. So uh, mm -hmm. we have to look for uh, any nystagmus in the uh, eye that was uncovered just now. In case if it is a vertical or diagonal movement, it will be more of central so cause. If there is no nystagmus on uncovering, that it is a most probably peripheral, peripheral cause. Peripheral. So, doing the hint, we can either come to a di uh, diagnosis whether the uh, nystagmus is of a peripheral or a central origin. So then you combine along with the positional, positional test. test. Otherwise called as? Dix-Holpike test. Dix test. Mm. Which is usually positive for posterior semicircular canal. Uh, done mostly in BPPV cases. So, usually the scenario what will happen in the ED, we always start with a positional mm -hmm. test followed by hints is what ideally need to be done. You need to approach it together. So, a positive or an equivocal uh, Dix-Holpeck test doesn't always rule out that this patient is not having a posterior circulation stroke. So, you combine along with hints test. So, you have a better outcome. So, you are just doing one thing will is not sufficient. You do your dix -Halpic. You think that it is positive, then mostly posterior semicircular canal. And if it is equivocal, then that is the dilemma. Then you combine along with hints. You combine along with hints and see if the head impulse is suggestive of peripheral vertigo. And Dix-Alpeg is equivocal. So mostly you are dealing with a peripheral vertigo. And the type of nystagmus that you are seeing is more suggestive of peripheral vertigo. Okay, then it is again peripheral vertigo. Then the skew test, whatever you have done, again it's suggestive. So we can have combined both these things together. You have a better predictability to say that whether this patient is having a posterior circulation stroke or whether the patient is having a peripheral vertigo. So, that these two important tests is the most important to differentiate for us in the emergency room. Simple bedside test where you will have better outcome. But remember that when doing Dixalpic test, you have to tell the patient that the patient might vomit. Wherever there is a symptom, the patient will have dramatic, there will be significant amount of vomiting. And practice of giving a vestibular sedative should be withheld until you are doing these tests. So, if the patient has already taken some tablets from outside because somebody has prescribed them, if you have motion sickness, you take this tablet. And after eliciting, definitely it will mask certain symptoms. So, it will be difficult for us to uh, elicit this from doing these two tests. So, that part also you should be very much clear. So, from this you have an you unlikely that it is a posterior circular, it is a posterior semicircular, dixalpic is negative and also hints is mostly favoring in terms of a central cause. That is the time, okay, this patient definitely need what imaging, not imaging, he need MRI imaging. You have to be very clear, he need an MRI imaging of brain to look for any posterior circulation stroke. So, that is what we need to be very much aware of. And meanwhile, you can take an ECG. I am not denying the fact that you should not be taking an ECG. You take an ECG. If you feel like there is atrial fibrillation is seeing in the ECG and also there is central sign, central uh, vertigo you are thinking, definitely you have to proceed with an MRI. Even your positional test is positive. Personally, if you ask me, I am seeing an arrhythmia and the patient is of high risk. Previous system, high risk TIA is there and ABCD2 score is very high. I will definitely go ahead and do an MRI scan for him. That is for sure. Uh, but if otherwise young chap, you are not suspecting, you can tell him these are the options. We are looking like this. Mm -hmm. So, you can avoid an MRI in that group of patients. Okay. Anything else that you want to add? Yes. Uh, causes of peripheral and central. Uh, in cases of peripheral vertigo, we could be having a BPPV. BPPV will be short-lived and positional episodes and probably caused by due to stray autoconial uh, particles. Uh, in here, dix holpike test will be mostly positive, posterior semi uh, semicircular canal. Then it could be Meniere's disease, tinnitus, hearing loss, along with uh, attacks of vertigo. So, this is classical of Meniere's disease. Then in case of vestibular neuronitis, the vertigo will be persisting for days, but uh, auditory uh, symptoms won't be there. Then in case of acoustic neuroma, that is one cause which could be prolonged, like hearing loss will be prolonged and then patient might have uh, vertigo. So, this can 
convert from peripheral to a central cause. Now, this is the only peripheral cause that can happen like this. Then labyrinthitis. Labyrinthitis, it could be due to serous labyrinthitis, it could be due to drug induced, it could be suppurative labyrinthitis. Most common cause of labyrinthitis is what? Uh, viral. Infection. Infection. Viral. Uh -huh. Short. You are having the very commonly you see patients mm -hmm. coming to the ED. Mm -hmm. They have an upper respiratory tract, tract infection. infection. Oh. Now they are having giddiness. Yes, so that's yeah. the most common thing is viral labyrinthitis. In such cases, patient will be having fever. Patient will be having uh, like looking toxic and vertigo will be severe. Then uh, central causes, either we have the vascular causes that are either cerebral hemorrhage could be there or cerebral uh, infarct Ischemia. would be there. Other than that, we have any patient who has recently had a head and neck trauma. Uh, no bleed as such, but post that also patient might have uh, persisting dizziness. Then uh, in case of any vertebrobacillar migraine or vertebrobacillar insufficiency. Vertebrobacillar migraine, usually vertigo will be pre uh, preceded by headache, most commonly. Uh, headache will coming later. Uh, uh, always followed by headache. Followed by yes, headache. Vertigo, it vertigo followed, followed by headache. headache. Like we said regarding ocular migraine, mm. visual disturbances, mm. color deficiency followed by headache. headache. And in vertebrobacillar insufficiency in advanced age mostly. And in case of uh, associated vertigo, it can be associated with other neurological deficits or the neurological test might be positive, uh, sorry, negative also. Uh, and other than that, we have some uh, scoring systems like to help us decide whether this patient might be requiring an imaging to rule out. We can convert a scoring, so we can create a scoring system mm. by comparing mm. Dick's help and this hints. Uh, Together we can see if this is positive, negative, equivocal. Mm. This These things are positive, unlikely to. Then we can follow up the patient and see what is happening. So all this scoring system, somebody mm. would have developed yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. Once or such system is triad score. Okay. Uh, basically, it is for patients who have come to the ED with dizziness or vertigo. So, uh, the scoring system basically low risk, intermediate, high, and very high. It consists of uh, whether patient has any triggers, triggers as in like uh, uh, triggers as in like any uh, deterioration of vertigo or dizziness after head motion. Mm -hmm. Then any atrial fibrillation history. Then whether mostly in males. Then uh, BP more than 140-90. Then any brain stem or cerebellar dysfunction history previously uh, any focal weakness the speech impairment or any focal deficit then uh, imbalance or disequilibrium then no history of vertigo or dizziness or labyrinthitis disease in the past uh, each has been scored differently and considering that if score is less than four it is low risk intermediate will be five to seven high risk will be eight to nine and more than nine that is ten to seventeen is very high risk which indicates we should go for a image uh, so this is from the history, history. What I said ah, is from yes, the examination. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, you can combine history and examination together and we can come out with a new scoring system. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you.